Can you think about a title from one of your favorite game franchises that is hated by the majority of the community? Well, today we are going to have a look at one of those. This is a game that by most is considered the black sheep of the franchise, the one that was probably the cause of the almost 10 year hiatus of the series. I don't think it's as horrible as some people say, but it's been some time since I have played it, let's find out if the game deserves all the hate people throw at it. No More Heroes 1 was a sales success in North America, thanks to this, the creation of the second one was sure to happen. But Suda51 was not a melee director for this one, because at the time he was working on other projects like Shadows of the Damned, he still worked as executive director, with some places going so far has given him credit for the whole writing of the game. Just like the first one, No More Heroes 2 was also a Wii exclusive. This probably kept the series in the underground, a fact that even Suda51 recognized in one of his interviews. And considering that some of the themes would not resonate well with nowadays politically correct stances, maybe it would be better if it stayed underground. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> maybe that's why she came. It's what she wants. Two grown men to keep her company. You don't care about this type of thing, let's get to the game. Once a god-forsaken city where the bodies of angels littered the streets, much has changed in Santa Destroy. Giant corporations, rampant city development, the assassin's underworld has become a commodity, a chance for profit and entertainment for the masses. But shadows from the wilder days still linger. Travis, a man who slashed his way to the top then walked away, has become an urban legend many even doubt was real. Here, the strong devour the weak, the weak kneel before the strong, and those who wield true power watch and count their gold. And in this mass-produced savagery, one truth is constant. With each shattered life, the same vow is uttered, I will have revenge. And no assassin can ever walk away from that. He must draw his beam and stand against the madness. This is Travis Touchdown's desperate struggle. Hold it, you violence-loving bastard. Before you start your desperate struggling, you should drop a nice save. Only by the clear difference between the trailers, we see that this game will try to take a more serial stone, mixed with the humor of the first one. There is also some world building that kind of escalates the plot. Of course, it could just be a reference to Metal Gear Solid 4. I think this one was a good idea. Not only for it being a great reference, it also keeps the spirit of the first game, and is a believable line of events that could happen in the No More Heroes universe. I mean, the series sometimes nonsensical on purpose, so in truth, they could pull out almost anything they wanted and add to the world. Let's put a pin on this, almost anything, for now. Just like in the first game, we start this one in a ranked fight. This Final Fantasy protagonist looking ass is Skelter Helter, the brother of the first assassin Travis killed in the trailer of the first game. As soon as the fight begins, you can feel some changes. Not only Travis' design, the combat is a lot more fluid, and you can also feel more the impact of your attacks. This fight itself is pretty easy, as expected of the tutorial boss. A lot of things were sugarcoated so you can learn the controls. I might be wrong with this one, but I think the design and movesets of this guy was made as generic as possible on purpose. In fact, just like his brother, he would be one of the most forgettable fights if it was not for one of the following scenes. In the middle of the fight, the game cuts to this corridor and the camera is in the view of someone who pays to enter in this place. This person slowly walks to the room 13, and there, we can see that is a peep show. If you don't know what a peep show is, well, I think this scene is pretty self-explanatory. I'm usually not someone that dislikes fan service, but I'm not too fond of these peep show scenes. I know the feeling they wanted to pass was that we are in some dirty place in a random red district alley. 
which they did manage to pass, but even if the second one is trying to have a more serious tone, I think this one strays too far away from the tone established by the first game. After this, we return to the Scouter Helter's fight, and since I have already told you the description of the fight, let's cut to the end. Right after defeating him, we hear a familiar voice coming from the speaker of a helicopter that somehow we didn't hear approaching. As expected, Sylvia is the one that comes out of the helicopter and she immediately gives Travis a vibe check as if nothing had happened at the end of the first game, but she is quick at answering our questions. Sylvia? Is that it? You gotta be kidding! I haven't seen you in three years and that's the welcome I get? How about you fill us in on everything that's happened since the last game? We're not gonna be satisfied until you do, right? Oh, give me a break. There are people starting from the sequel who don't care about continuity, you know. Besides, it would take forever... Then, she explains that Skelter Helter was actually the 51st assassin in the ranked fights, and that because of this, Travis was now back in the fighting ranks. And you know, this beginning is looking a lot like the one of the first game. Even the motivation they give Travis to keep fighting is the same. That is, until the second game's identity finally shows up. Give me this time, I've already tasted those goods. But just a taste, this time you'll get the five-course meal. Five course? Mm. Wait, I don't get what that means. Did you know I am a yoga master? Hmm? Oh yeah! I'm in it to win, baby! Number one, here I come! Hey! We're not done yet! I've got a message for you! Oh my, he's still alive! Pain in my ass. Why aren't you dead yet? Such blind arrogance. Like the naked emperor. Seriously? I cut off your head? Travis! You are the loser. This fight was only part of our plan. Our plan? I said I'd avenge you killing my brother, didn't I? Well, who's been a brother to you? What? Travis. Don't think you can kill without suffering consequences. I think the scenes were to communicate that this game will try to be an addition to the first one, not merely a repetition, initially giving him the same motivation of the first game, and right after that they present us a motivation with the more serial stone of the second one. Or, the writer simply decided to give multiple motivations to the main character, one that is funny, and other that is not. Now oh, it's your turn to be burdened with another's death. It has destroyed me, and it will destroy you too. This is the ultimate vengeance! Hiroshima say I was just uh doing inventory. Help you find something? Nah. We're just here to collect. Travis She was it's clear what happened, but Travis is about to find out.
Before we go on, I need to talk about the assets of the game. If you just want to hear about the story, I marked on the video the segments I will go back to it. Travis still lives in his motel room. This time, it feels a lot more empty than the last. But this is not to pass a feeling of loneliness or anything of the sort. This room will be filled with decorations along the game. As you can see, we can walk around freely through his room, only having to approach some specific furnitures in order to open the menus. Every menu of the game is pretty much the same of the last game, with some exceptions like the two mini games that were added. One of them we can play by approaching the TV. This one is very well made and it's worth at least a run. If you finish it, you'll be rewarded with the opening of Travis' favorite anime slash game. The other mini games around Jean. This one is a stiff reminder that, no matter how much positivity you have towards your body, the heart diseases will still come, nonetheless. If you want to help Jean lose weight, you have to remember to take care of her diet and exercises every time you come back to the motel. Just remember that, when you are finished, you cannot interact with her anymore. At this point, the game had already caught me. The story was looking as interesting as the first game. The combat mechanic, which is the main mechanic for a hack and slash, was way better than the first one. Even exploring new things in the motel room was interesting. I was very anxious to see how they reworked the city of Santa's Destroy. To the end, it's gone. Yes, they added the fast travel everyone wanted to be in the first game, and then followed it to remove all the rest. The removal of the city exploration felt really bad, not gonna lie. I think they just had to work on it a little more to make it more interesting, not remove it all as if nothing could be used. But the big critics at the time considerably reduced the first game score because of the city. And this game was released before the Gamergate events, so the opinions of the big game journalists still was very relevant for the game sales and the public in general. Well, we also have to take into account that they were not wrong on this one. The city was empty and kind of boring after some time. In the end, it was safer to just remove the feature and work on all the rest. Almost all of the activities and side jobs will involve this 8-bit minigame format. They are fun to play, don't become tedious to do like the ones of the first game, especially because the rewards in this one are bigger, meaning that we don't need to repeat them that much. So, they cut the budget to remove in the city and also in the minigames. Don't get me wrong, I like them, but they were not exactly expensive to make in the late 2000s. I'm anxious to see where they reinvested this budget. You can also go to the gym, where this nice teacher will show the right manners to exercise. We can also visit Naomi's lab, and god damn, at least now we know where all the money we gave her in the first game was reinvested. This time, we can alternate between weapons along the game, each of them have a different combo and function. The third one we will acquire is absolutely broken. It was supposed to be for crowd control, its size grows together with the ecstasy gouge mechanic. The disadvantage of this one was supposed to be that it take a long time to land an attack. But since you can now hit your enemies from the other side of the street, the balancing has been thrown out of the window. And it's no coincidence, this is my favorite weapon in the game. There are also these revenge missions where we will go after the six guys that murdered our bishop. They pretty much function like the assassination missions of the first game. Speaking of bishop, let's go back to the story of the game. Travis meets Sylvie in the restaurant in front of the motel. She explains to him that the man who ordered Bishop's assassination is in fact the CEO of the biggest corporation in Santa Destroy. Pizza Bat. Jasper Jr. owns pretty much everything of notice in the city, and on top of that, he's number one in rank. Fight whoever it takes, and in return, you find me the assholes who killed Bishop. Calm down. You shouldn't make this personnel. It is the quickest way to lose a battle. This isn't a battle anymore. It's a motherfucking war. Fine. It makes no difference really. The mastermind behind Bishop's death is the owner of Pizza Bat. This building? Most of this city? He is the head of the corporation that runs it all. Jasper Bat Jr. And as fate would have it, he is also the number one assassin. As the UOA rules establishing the first game dictated, we can only face him after beating all the other ranked assassins and... Wait, something's wrong here. Wasn't the UOA a lie that Sylvia invented in order to trick impressionable young assassins into doing her bidding? Yes, it was. It's not a thing that stops you from enjoying the game. However, I have to recognize this is a huge continuity error. Not only this was an important fact in the first game, it also heavily affects the second one at the point that this is a crucial factor for the story. 
Without the UAA rules, nothing would stop Travis from just striding to Pizza Bet's company building and killing number one. I mean, I will do just like the game and simply ignore this fact for the rest of the video. But I think it is something worth of notice. In this scene, we have a briefing about the fifth ranked assassin. Apparently, this guy is a cult leader that recruits people using his music. His dungeon is this big hotel, and the enemies are security guards. This game has way less themed enemies. They are either the security guards or Yakuza themed. At the same time, it has more variety in types of enemies. For example, in the first game, we only had four types two melee and two ranged ones. In this game, you have more subcategories of these ones. Before the boss fights, we don't gain any new move like in the first game. This time, there is only the toilet. This must be karma. Travis touchdown. The fifth assassin starts the fight throwing his goods at us. I see the rumors were true. I don't know who's talking about me, but that nickname's all right. Listen to me, your highness. These rankings mean nothing to me. Neither does my sect or the mob. My only true calling was to clash swords with you. That's why I joined this contest. I was starving for a worthy fool. Then you're in luck. Because I'm as worthy as it gets. And I've got a shit ton of anger to work out. That's what I like to hear. This is it. This is what I've been praying for. I'm weary of this gilded world. Oh, glitter. No soul. Save me from sorrow, crownless king. Thy sword and thy wrath will deliver me. Uh. You should go easy on that crazy punch. How about I just cut you a new one? We'll both do as divinity commands. Hallelujah. Well, Religio's demo main right here would not be a difficult fight if it was not for all the traps in this room. And I think this was a really cool detail. All the ranked assassins before the top 10 will depend heavily on gimmicks and traps. Don't try to defend his ranged attacks. You will end up without batteries for the katana, and he will stun lock you. This was the only thing that really gave me some work. The other ones are pretty easy to dodge. Congratulations! On a fantastic victory! You are now ranked 50th! Just 49 left. This is gonna take a while. You were spectacular! Better hurry. Like you said, I don't want anybody getting to that bat bastard first. Look at you, Travis. Violence is the only way you can express yourself, no? Oh, I'm in the zone, baby. Nothing's gonna hold me back. Good. I'll arrange the next fight. It's going to blow your mind. Can't fucking wait. Well, she's right on this one. The next fight will blow your mind. Just not in the way you are expecting. Maybe not even the way they are expecting. From now on, all the meetings with Sylvia will be in her office, at the UAA building. Here we'll receive a briefing about the fourth knife in rank, Charlie and his groupies. think it would be so fancy, considering the nature of your work. I'm an agent. Anything less would be uncivilized. Now, take a seat. Let's get started. Right. So, who's next? Charlie and his groupies. Groupies? What's that supposed to mean? Thanks. If I told you now, I'd ruin the surprise. Go see for yourself. Fine. Whoever they are, I'll make sure they get a nice close-up of my bean katana. Sometimes the game tries to double down on the more serial stone. But the dialogue just comes out as edgy when they do this and try to land a joke that would work in the original style. Some people fuck at funerals. I cut off heads. This next ranked fight will be at Santa Destroyer University. This dungeon looks nice, only that it feels bigger than it is because of this enemy wave asset they use it. Right after defeating some enemies, a car will appear in the dungeon and more enemies will come out of it. 
and for now this is fine. Boy, I just hope they do not abuse this thing in an upcoming phase. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. Then we have one of the best intros of the game. In this one, we will face all the people from rank 49 to rank 25. I think the intro is very funny. In fact, as I said, I think it's one of the best in the game. But you wanna know what? We can discuss this later. Let's enjoy this fever dream. After this, I'm gonna touch you down. A butt kicking day to you all. Especially you, cupcake. Mr. Touchdown! It's an honor to face you. Man, I love your name. You gonna fight me with all your hoes? That's my game, but we need a better arena, don't you think? Huh? Let's go, ladies! Santa Death Parade! <laughs> I thought something like this might happen. Time to bust out the toy Naomi made. Making his long-awaited debut... Glastonbury! Let's pop! This is a very simple fight. It's a big reference to both old fighting arcade games and the cliché of old mecha animes. After defeating Charlie, Sylvia appears and says that the UAA will confiscate Travis' robots. Understandable, we can't be running around with this thing, and the excuse the game gives us is good enough. The game gives us the first introduction about its more supernatural themes, like the Akashic Gates, places that can bring you to other planes of existence if you enter it. The strange thing is that the next rank of the fight will not use this new information at all. So it's easy to forget the game told you that there will be some supernatural themes. It's not bad or anything, I just think that it could be put in a better place. On the introduction of the next fight, Sylvia is back with a display of her bipolar disorder. Whoa there, Ice Queen. What's with the harsh treatment? I do not have time to waste on 25th rank scrubs like you! Take a Whoa. hit, you impotent dipshit! Huh? I like her better when she's horny. I think this dungeon is the shortest we had until now. It's also easy in the university, but this time everything is in ruins. It's literally a run from the front gates to the boss arena. Just take care not to be shanked by these guys. But it actually makes sense for it to be so short, since this time we will be fighting someone who has been hunting Travis. This one is a mixture of Oblivion's adoring fan and a schoolgirl. She is very happy to finally meet her idol in person. Um, uh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, can I call you Travis the Great? Travis Ravenous? Cool hand, teasy greasy. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I, uh, I've always been a fan. Oh, you are hardcore. So cool. Oh, no. Oh, I feel really nervous. I think I'm gonna puke. OMG, I bet you hate girls who puke. Uh, never really thought about it. <laughs> Don't stare at me. You're staring at me. If you get me preggers, promise you won't ditch me, okay? <laughs> anyway, I wrote down all my feelings in a letter. Here, take it. Your, uh, feelings? So this is a love letter? 
After some comedic reading of a very long and elaborated love letter, the fight begins. Okay, thanks. I could use a dose of innocence. Because no matter how much I insist that I'm your number one, any other chick or bitch can approach you and say the exact same thing. And then I got greedy. A new urge, a vision, that just maybe I could win a fight against Travis the Great. Now my goal is to behead Travis the Great, therefore surpassing my hero. Only then will Travis the Great become mine and mine only. Love, Travis the Great's number one fan, Kimmy Howell. Okay, so much for the dose of innocence. This fight is so easy I could not even catch her moves at right. She only spammed this attack that resembles a ballet movement. I even waited to see some of them before ending the fight, and I'm glad I did. I wasn't expecting this goofy running animation. The good laugh I had with this compensated the short boss fight. The presentation was also very funny. We defeated her, but just like we have seen with Shinobu, Travis don't kill schoolgirls. Screw this! I can't kill a co-ed. Come see me after you graduate, and I'll school you again. In the 24th Ranked Assassin's Dungeon, Travis entered one of those Akashic Gates. This whole segment remembers me of some famous horror games, like Resident Evil 4 and that forest segment in Silent Hill 4. Travis enters a creepy house in the middle of the forest, and starts to notice some strange things inside it. Until this guy appears, his name is Matt Helms. Chances are that he's a Jason Voorhees reference, but he really remembers me of Piggly from Manhunt. It probably isn't, this game is basically taboo to talk about even today. I had some difficulty in this boss fight, it's really difficult to approach him because of his flamethrower that deals area damage. If you go too far he will start to spam the molotovs that deals a lot of damage. I also kept insisting on attacking him by the front. In looking at the footage, the back was a clear weak spot that I never tried to exploit. After putting the big guy down, this character is trying to kill Travis. It turns out that this ghost was the one controlling our body positive pyromaniac fellow. <laughs> this is the problem with fighting the supernatural. You cannot kill someone who's already dead. Already dead? Okay. Are you on the pipe? Such a horrible past. Thirty years ago, that child was abandoned, left to die in this house. As the story goes, he made a pact with the devil with his final breath. Revived through the dark arts, the child murdered his parents and now rules this forest, feeding on suffering and hate. All assassins are fucked up somehow, or we wouldn't be in this profession. Nothing surprises me anymore. Now you are ranked 24th. Still a ways to go until the top. You are not getting tired? Huh. I haven't even broken a sweat. Why don't you bring me a real challenge? <laughs> You've got it. Travis, it's me. I have set up your next battle. Check out the map and go when you please. Oh, and by the way, until you crack the top 10, you are responsible for all travel expenses. The association can pay for everyone with the price of gas and all. Hold up, I'm shelling out all this cash and you can't spring for bus fare? I'm busy, got to go. Don't hang up on me. Oh.
The dungeon of the 23rd Assassin is a big prison complex. This one is a big reference to the Metal Gear Solid series. You can play this one without being noticed, but I always sucked at stealth games, and I was no different in this one. Travis enters a giant chamber with a lot of lasers and a woman caged in the center of it. That is our target, Chloe Walsh. Or Chloe Walsh, I don't know. Chicks put out for their rescuers, right? Ah, I guess that's a no. You know, you're lucky I don't have a bondage kick. <laughs> His pervert's nature once again zeroed against him. But luckily, he manages to escape at the last moment. Well, damn. What was I thinking? She's definitely not a broad I'd want to hook up with. Don't say that, handsome. Actually, you're just my type. Thanks. But no thanks. You'd be even more dashing if you were writhing in agony. Come closer to me. Huh? Show me your face twisted in pain. My body! A lot of these games' boss fights have the same problem of this one. The boss has a nice design, music, and presentation. But their HP is so low, we can't even enjoy the fight. I basically did not catch the moveset of this one because of how fast I put her down. The game is very unceremonious about this boss death, so I don't have much to add up besides that she looks like the writer's badly disguised fetish. Travis breaks the laws of physics and Sylvia comes back with her bitch behavior. The game pulls out a good excuse to jump some ranks. This next fight will be a battle royale between ranks 21 to 10. Um, uh, who? That person? Uh, nobody. He's just the uh, newspaper delivery man. Taking the emergency exit is faster. Hey, that's true. The paper boy's a genius. I know, right? Anyway, let's talk about the rules for your next ranking battle. Rules? Something's changed? Yes, the association resorts to this when there isn't much activity in the rankings, or when there are too many strong fighters, or sometimes when we just get bored. Mm. A battle royale. Battle royale? A fight to the death with 12 participants. If you win, You'll jump to the 10th rank. Damn, that's a twisted way to do things. You agents are becoming as fucked up as the killers you rep. Oh, we've always been fucked up, as you say. We just wear nicer clothes. Fucked up assassins working with fucked up agents. Huh, doesn't get any better than this. Will you be the last man standing? No doubt. I'll kill them all in a flash. Getting there, Travis has to wait for a while. And when we are finally ready, we see all the other opponents getting disintegrated, leaving only one enemy, Dr. Let's Shake It. If you remember well, this was the fifth in rank in the last game. We never got to fight him because Travis' half-brother, Henry, got him first. He says that his primary objective these last years was to hunt Travis and his brother. In fact, he reveals that he had already caught Henry. Ignoring the obvious Star Wars reference, I think it's kind of funny they slided this boss design into a game with a 12 years and up age rating. The fight is fun, but it's not difficult at all. The only thing you have to really be aware of are the styles that are shaken. If it's only that I'm rushing the fights, 
I'm not. They are either so easy to play they end up in seconds, or the boss don't have a dungeon at all, so I have nothing to comment about. Jumping so many ranks after they sold us that we are going to go against 50 other ranked assassins is frustrating. I know they tried to do the trope of subverting expectations for a comedic effect, and for this end, both times it worked fine. However, a lot of people at the time felt cheated by this, and they kinda have a point for it. I will address this again later, so I will not speak so much of it right now. Sylvia and Shinobu appear after the fight. It turns out she was the one in the meeting room. Shinobu starts to call Travis master, but he does not like the idea very much. Master? It's been a long time. Shinobu? How did... Wait, what did you say? Did you call me master? I don't have time for apprentices. You have any idea how much pro wrestling is backlogged on my VCR? Sylvia called her back from Asia so she could help him in the ranked fights. Travis refuses, then she says that she needs to tell him a story. Are you listening? I'm not your master. My only desire was to become strong like you, master. So I trained hard, and I fought to become the champion of Asia. Here's my belt. No way. You won this? That's pretty badass. I was told the competition was heating up in Santa Destroy, and my master was overburdened. Me? Overburdened? Who told you that? Sylvia. She said I should come back and help you. What? Who's that bitch think she is, my nanny? Listen up, Shinobu. This is my war. I don't need help from anybody. Well, the thing is, it's kinda too late for that. Huh? What are you talking about? I'll explain later, Master. But you should go to the bathroom first. Seriously, it's a long story. Fine, but I'm not your goddamn master! We now see the story from Shinobu's perspective. She and Sylvia don't seem to like each other very much. Then, it's come the revelation that she had already taken care of the two ranked assassins, rank 9 and rank 8. This time I have to compliment the game. These two are not just rank skips like the other times. We actually play as Shinobu while she's on the hunt for both assassins. It's a very nice and well-made surprise. Not only she has a whole move set apart from Travis, she also has a special ability, and she can also jump. Her combat is faster, and I think she also deals way more damage than Travis, but her HP is way lower. The jump mechanic is nice to see, because the devs are showing us they want to do something more than the dungeons of the first game, and they did both of her areas based on it. The 9th and 8th dungeons of the game are the most distinct, thanks to it, but the mechanic unfortunately is very clunky. The 9th dungeon is a bank, it's kind of long compared with the others we have until now. It's also the best one from the two we've played as Shinobu. The 9th in rank resembles Dr. Peace, both in fighting style and in appearance. It's nice to see that Shinobu has a different kind of interaction with the ranked assassins, unfortunately. This one is rather unremarkable in terms of presentation. If you kill me, you can fight Travis. But that's a huge it. You talk a lot of trash for a child. Let's get to the fun. His fights just take a while because we have to pursue him every time he enters one of these doors. And we have to deal with the jumping mechanics. What? Any last words? Just give me your name. When the gatekeeper to hell asks who sent you, tell him it was Shinobu Jacobs. Yes, sir. Enjoy your trip. The 8th Assassin's Dungeon is a military base. There will be some moments where you need to pass through the building's rooftops. Try not to fall, or else you have to make a long walk back. The worst part is that this was made on purpose. The enemies in these parts were made exactly to stunlock you, then push you over. I think this is not only cheap, it's also very annoying when the game found these unnecessary repetition parts. The 8th in rank is someone we already know. 
New Destroyman has two parts. One is extremely polite, and the other acts like your average internet stroll. Terrible things can happen. I see it on the news all the time. <laughs> Maybe that's why she came. It's what she wants. Two grown men to keep her company. <laughs> Horny slut. My master's got his hands full, so I'm taking his place. Not that it matters. The result's gonna be the same. I don't have time for this. You're taking Travis's place? Wow. I gotta say, I'm feeling pretty disrespectful. Just shut up and fight. Oh, listen to this whore. Acting like she's some kind of femme fatale. Shut up and fight, she says. She's really pissing me off. Seriously. And she's so rude. Reminds me of my complaining customers. Now, Travis, he knew how to fight like a gentleman. Sliced me in half, sure, but he did it with grace. I mean, come on. Put her there. Huh? You know, let's shake hands. Sportsmanship is paramount to a fair and clean fight. <sighs> Hurry up and shake! Dirty nympho. <laughs> Whatever. But which one? It doesn't matter. Your choice. The one that's throbbing. Destroy Spark. What the? What? Ah! Was this supposed to spark? Wait. Ah! A filthy skank! Yeah, that wasn't smart. I'll be sure Travis gets your head in the mail. Enough with your freak show. Now bring it. We're gonna, gonna kill, kill you twice, twice over. over. This boss fight is also surprisingly good compared with his counterpart from the first game. One of them will shoot you from afar, and the other will focus in melee attacks. The only lame part is that once the melee counterpart is down, the fun is basically over, because the other one will make you run after him around the arena like a retard. Still, overall, it was a good presentation, good fight, and a shit dungeon. Really blows. I can't believe I fell for that. In the next scene, Shinobu is visiting Bishop's grave, and we will have a cameo of the Japanese director Takashi Miki. I never watched one of his works, but Soda 51 seems to love them. I think I'll watch one of them out of curiosity, and I will talk about it if I ever make a video about No More Heroes 3. Miike tells Shinobu to give this mysterious package to Travis, then vanishes. On the next scene, Shinobu makes some advances on her master. While she's getting rejected, let's ponder a bit about what happened. If I remember well from the first game, a ranked fight is only valid when the last ranked assassin is dead. Else, the contestant will be stopped by the UAA. Shinobu defeated ranks 9 and 8, before rank 10 was dead. I don't think this is a nitpick, because this exact rule that the game just ignored is the only excuse for Travis not going after rank 1 right now. You could also say that he's doing this because he wants to shag Sylvia, and their agreement was that he had to defeat all the ranked assassins if he wanted to get some of that. But this don't seem to be his main objective. In fact, this one got sort of forgotten by the game right now. I can't. I feel like that pervy teacher in a porn. It's me! I am sending the next fight to your map. So? You can really count on her, yes? The rest should be easy now that she has done her part. Yeah. Wait! Hmm? Something wrong? Nah, it's nothing. The next sucker's all mine. The seventh in rank is a fight that divides most fans. Some say it's a slop because of the first phase, and the second one is unfair because of one broken attack. Others say that's one of the best bosses in the game, both in combat and story.
this fight turns out to be really easy once you know the gimmicks. On the first phase, you just have to push his motorbike over the cliff. This can be done in literally 10 seconds after it begins. The second phase is more interesting. Huge feels like a real fight, the first one of the game. His dragon attack deals a lot of damage, but is very easy to dodge. His movements are fast, but the guy is still a tank. Had nothing left. I know that, but he was a true warrior, and you gunned him down like a thug. This is not some peewee karate tournament, Travis. You do not play bows and go home. You are an assassin, and killing is how you win. But I In the first video, I said that Sylvia would cross the line eventually. Well, this is what I was referencing. For the rest of the game, Travis' attitude towards her becomes way more hostile because of this. Just finish the job, or we will do it for you. These fights are not a sport. Shit. This next segment I like to call Henry's Excellent Fever Dream. Have fun watching. I must be having a nightmare. Or am I? Who's this little cutie? Is she real? Is she dangerous? How'd you do that? Read your thoughts? Well, you gave them to me. That doesn't make any sense. I was hoping you'd wander around some more. Explore. Me? Yes, you. You did not want to go back, so you reached out to my consciousness instead. Now we are one. Let's play. Away with ye. I said be gone. You should stay here forever. No way. We live together. I'll never leave. I'm going back. If you want to go to the other side, then I have no choice. I've got to kill you. Why don't you come with me? You like it there? I know you're trying to trick me. I will not even lose my time asking what the hell just happened. My guess is that Mimi was supposed to represent death. This is most certainly wrong, but the whole crossing of the shore symbolism of this arena makes me like this idea, so this will be my headcanon. Ironically, this is one of the best boss fights of the game, being fast paced and kind of difficult if you try to face her head on. My only complaint is that this is the only time in the whole game we are able to play as Henry. I'm saying this not for the character itself, despite the fact that I like Henry. It's more because of his moveset. The devs had the whole work of putting it together and only use it this time. Ignoring that Travis was tugging out a quick one, 
This is a very nice scene. I think this was their version of brotherly love. Hell? About time you woke up. Yeah. Are you the one who rescued me? I had a fight to win. You were just collateral damage. So get out when you can manage it. Until then, I've got some good shit on video. We'll see about that. <laughs> well, you know what time it is. I just said a good thing about the game. It's time to counter this with another bad thing. In this next scene, Henry left a message for Travis, saying that he took out two of the following ranked fights and a guy that was hunting down Travis. This scene is funny, but I can't help but to feel blue balled by this game. I'll leave this ranting for later. You've got to so be kidding me! Would you fifth. fucking people and stop no stealing my me. kills? This makes us even, as far as the rescue goes. You and I still have a score to box off, but that's another subject entirely. So don't get yourself killed till we have a chance to finish our fight. Damn it! Irish ass. He could at least have told me more about those assassins. And in case you were wondering, well, I took pictures of the three skangers as souvenirs. How long is this you message? Rule over them. Because there's no way you can play through these fights. The game's stuff full as it is. The game's stuff full as it is. The game's stuff full as it is. Sylvia tells Travis that she and Henry are now divorced. Travis don't seem to care much about that. And I think this is a good thing. Her disrespecting Travis' fights would not have so much impact if he was already on good terms with her. The fourth Assassin's Dungeon is one that I have mixed feelings about. It starts at this giant parking lot outside the supermarket. You will be stuck in this first part for at least 15 minutes. Remember what I said about abusing the car gimmick where four new enemies spawn from it. This phase is the definition of overusing that, in a way that I didn't even try to be subtle. As I said, this arena is very big and the cars spawning the enemies usually appear on the literal opposite side of each other, meaning that you have to cross all the arena many times, kill some enemies, then repeat the process. They do this more than 5 times. It's obvious that this was a cheap way to make the game take more time to be finished. My only complaint is that they could have found a way to do this without calling the player an idiot. Especially after telling us that, quote unquote, the game is still full as it is. If they kept just the second part of the dungeon, this would probably be one of the best. This segment has everything the other lacked. Challenging enemies, good music, and most importantly, it doesn't keep you doing the same thing for 15 fucking minutes. The 4th Ranked Assassin's presentation is very short. Know this song? Nope. How tragic. Then let me teach you. The focus here is more on the music instead of the presentation. Honestly, I usually dislike this type of music, but this one's a banger. Her fight alternates between two parts. In the first one, she will be on the ground shooting at you. In this phase, you can deal damage. Just don't run straight up into her direction. In the second phase, she will be shooting at you from afar. If you don't pick up the timing of her shots, she can easily stunlock you, so be careful. Melody, isn't it? Catchy as hell. Did you... Did you memorize the song? 100%. That... is so... sublime. Three to go.
The third in rank does not have a dungeon. Instead we have the segment with the motorbike that is pretty cool. Getting into the arena, Travis is received by a strange vision. You've got to be Mayday, Mayday, Mayday! Spaceship Volk to Mother! Do you copy? Please respond! Spaceship Volk to Mother! The strange cosmonaut is Captain Vladimir. He believes that he's still in space and an American has followed him there. I really like his design. This is also one of the most memorable fights of the game. The man is basically a ghost with futuristic weapons. He uses teleportation, lasers and a shield to fight against Travis. His last scene is also tragic. He dies right after realizing he's back on Earth. My ship. It's over, Captain. This... this is Earth? Yeah. Welcome home. So... I'm finally back. After all this time. Fresh oxygen. Blue sky. Beautiful as I remember. Glory to the Soviet Union. Silver comes again with her bitch ways and tries to disrespect another battle. But Travis finally snaps at her. Just leave him alone. Let him rest in peace. We must dispose of the remains. It's policy. Screw your policy. He's back with the Earth after who knows how long. You're not gonna suck him up with your damn vacuum. You've heard about two of the supernatural gateways in Santa Destroy. The third led to the most fitting mystery of all for a city fixated on the ranks. Sealed from the cacophony of modern life, there lived the last ascetic. Abstaining from all worldly indulgences, the ascetic spent every waking hour in training. Battle had become an obsession for this warrior, the end all. The raison d'etre. You know I've never abstained from anything. Still, I can relate. When you're so focused on any goal, it can make you blind to what you truly desire. Arrange the next match. Only two left. Win this, and that junior is yours. The duel will take place at a secret location. Secret? I don't have time for guessing games. It's the final Akashic point. Look for the hero space. Sorry, that's all the information I have. Figure it out and get there. Damn you. I left these two cutscenes here because they are efficient at explaining the situation. Travis enters an Akashic point and gets into the Soviet-style apartment blocks. I thought this was the longest dungeon in the game. At least, this was the feeling I had while playing. But after comparing the footage time, the fourth Assassin's dungeon is still bigger than this one. The second in rank boss fight is another memorable one. She has also a good presentation, passing a certain sense of nobility, knowing that she is probably going to lose the fight, but fighting anyway. Travis touchdown, correct? Yeah, that's me. The no more hero. How unfortunate. Right when I'm about to reach the top, you have to find me. I was hoping we'd fight after I became number one. Sorry to crush your dreams. I hate to do it. But I've got business with that son of a bitch. And I can't let you get to him first. Please, don't think of me as a nuisance. But I will make sure your victory isn't easy. My pride as the second rank requires that much. Honorable. I like that in a woman. 
I've seen a lot in my journey up the ranks. An endless cycle of violence, now broadcast as a spectator's sport. Why, Travis? Why do so many assassins join if we are all going to end up killing each other in the end? Does it really matter why? To me, it does. It matters more than anything. We have all become trapped, don't you see? Addicted to the violence, to a life in the shadows. Once we join the ranks, we can never get out. Don't be stupid. If you get tired of the battles, just fucking quit. But that's why we all want to fight you, to learn your secret. Don't you get it? Get what? You are the crownless king, the one who got out. You reached the top, then walked away. Well, I'm back now, aren't I? With you, it is different. You are the no more hero. Show me your passion. Release me from this cycle. Free us all in a crimson sea. You asked for it. Bring it on! Most people say that Alice's fight is one of the best. I think it is because the intro made them care or respect the character. She has some interesting moves in design because of the spider arms, but her fight is not hard at all. After defeating her, we see a clear difference between the Travis we've seen at the start of the game and the one we have now. Unfortunately, these moments are very rare in the second game. It lacks a certain subtonus in the writing. My incredible. Everything I hoped for. Tell me your name. Promise me you won't forget. There once was an assassin named Alice. I won't forget. Alice. You are now officially ranked second. See that? Now that was a battle. Look at this blood. We humans are alive, even if we are assassins. Doesn't matter if it's a video game, movie, drama, anime, manga, we're alive! People shed blood and die. This isn't a game. You can't just selfishly use death as your tool. This is Alice's blood. I bet you've already forgotten she existed. Same way you would have forgotten me. And that's why I'm tearing down the UAA! Are you done bitching? You could never shut down the association. Fighting to be the best is human nature. It's evolution. Who are we to try and stand in its way? Fuck that. I want to be a hero by my own standards. You need to wake up, Travis. Take your own goddamn advice. Because of this last scene, Travis. the next one seems like Sylvia's last attempt at manipulating Travis. To the death? Yeah. You know where to go? It's close by. Hold on. Someone's at the door. It's my first time here, isn't it? A VIP just showed up. Talk to you soon. Sure. I have to say, this is exactly what her archetype would do in this situation. However, now that I have played the other two games, I see the scene has Sylvia's turning point, from a manipulative, cold-hearted bitch to someone who actually cares for Travis. You lie, you're greedy, you're a fucking contradiction in heels. You hate me. Well, your personality kind of sucks. So you do hate me. I'm crazy about you. What do you mean? Fuck if I know. I don't remember anything else, but you see, I've forgotten everything. This place
place is closing today. The owner is shutting us down and moving back to his hometown. It'd be nice to go home too. Since it's the last day, are you expecting something special? What are you expecting? Why do you listen? Well, it doesn't matter. I never really expected to know. You came here almost every day. You paid to hear me ramble on. And that gave me as much happiness as I can hope for. After falling this far, there's nothing left to lose. Every day as joyless as the one before it. With eyes closed, I continue to endure my existence. But I feel that I've been able to open them just a little. Today, since it's our last chance, I want to hear your voice. Let me hear what you sound like, who you are. Just once. So, let's finally talk about the first ranked assassin. His dungeon is the Pizza Bat Company building. It is quite long and has two parts, the main plaza and the upper floors. We will go against every type of enemy the game has to offer. Until we get to the main fight, Jasper Bat Jr. A really pale, high-pitched voiced cartoon villain. There you are! Travis! Took you long enough! Thought the suspense was gonna kill me! How will he make his entrance? Is he emo or grunge? What's his fighting style? How's his broke-ass face gonna look when he dies? So much hostility! Why? Why'd you kill him? Ironic question coming from an assassin! Did you honestly think you could take so many lives and never suffer retribution? Have you never even seen a kung fu movie, spy flick, or western? Shakespeare, for God's sake! If you wanted revenge, you should have come for me! Not only did you murder my father, but my two brothers as well. That is why I took your best friend's life. Makes sense, Travis. It's called poetic justice. Go to hell. Don't ever compare Bishop with your shithead family. He and Travis menace each other for a while, until three men enter the room and make a big revelation. Sylvia, Shinobu, and Henry are dead. Now you're feeling it. That's your life losing all meaning. You've got nothing left except this fight. Now I know you'll put all you have into this. You're gonna fucking pay. Yes, a fight to the death. Get angry. So angry you start convulsing. Now, draw your katana. I'll relish every moment, every second of this kill. May you savor your death as well. Enough! Let the final battle begin! Where do I even begin to talk about Jasper? Well, let's talk about his boss fighting moves, then we can address the elephant in the room. He will stay in his flying car during the fight, he will summon these bats that can shoot laser, and sometimes he will try to run over Travis. If you just stay under his car, he cannot hit you. When his HP lowers to a certain point, this cutscene will trigger. We discover that those heads were fake and Henry joins the fight by distracting these bats that were no problem at all. Jeez, well aren't I a gullible idiot? These are pretty sweet, actually. Think I can take one of these home? After you kill him, why not? I'll handle his ring piece goons! Thanks, bro. Now, Jasper will try to run you over, and the only way to damage him is by parrying this attack. Just stay in the center of the room and wait for him to try and hit you. This attack deals a lot of damage, and if you are like me and suck at parrying, you might have to repeat this a number of times. If you think the fight is over, you are very mistaken. Jasper injects himself with... water. Christmas time, goddammit! I love it! Okay, so... In this package, water, just simple fucking water, that's it. 
<laughs> Water! So... You gotta be shitting me! I've seen a lot of people complaining about the exact part of the boss fight, and I can see their points. Compared with the rest of the game, this phase has a crazy difficult spike. Jasper Jr. is now not only buffed, he can also move really fast and sometimes use instant transmission like a Dragon Ball Z character. He also deals a lot of damage in every attack that lands. That's a wrap. Uh, no, not yet. Now that's hideous. This boss has one more phase where he becomes this giant parade balloon. And to be honest, I'm with Henry on this one. Wait a second. You're already here. You might as well keep fighting. It's not happening, brother. I can't be associated with that travesty. I mean, I've got standards for fuck's sake. This fight's pretty much over. He will only hit you if you go out of your way and let him do it. So, this might not be a surprise, but most people hated Jasper Jr. And the first time I played the game, I also hated him. I understand there is the whole trope of subverting expectations because everyone was waiting for him to have a character design way different from this one. And that every one of his faces is supposed to be a parody of boss fights in general. It's usually a super buffed and overpowered dude or giant monster. It's impressive that in many ways, this joke works until today. But these are only details. People hate him because the game built up this fight every time it could, and the delivery was this cartoon villain. While writing the script, I had some time to think about this fight. I should not like it, but not only this boss would work if it was in any of the following games of the series, you got to respect the guy who wrote this thing. Not only he sticked to his guns until the end, throwing all the build up for the fight away for a shit post. He doubled down making his second and third phase something close to what the player was probably expecting. Go! Yeah! Oh, fuck. So, we have some problems with this game's writing. Not only we had a serious continuity error, we also had some big plot holes, and the problem of the rank skips. I have already addressed this continuity error. There is also the plot holes, also involving the UA, specifically its rules. In the first game, it was established that an assassin that was going up in the ranks would have to face the next in rank and could not go after the others above it until he had won said fight. I'm assuming the second game also kept this rule because without it, having ranks would not make any sense. Everyone would just go after number one instead of losing time facing 50 other guys. Shinobu breaks this rule when she kills two ranked assassins before Travis defeated the next in rank. You could just say that Sylvia ignored this fact. But seeing how much Sylvia always plays by the UA rules, it would be outside her character to do something like that. About the rank skips, this is the one I really have a problem with, the other two I'm pointing out just for the sake of this analysis. More than once, this game sold itself on the fact that we would have to face a large number of opponents before we could get to number one. But three times the game used the trope of subverting expectations for comedy's sake, which does work, but it leaves some players feeling cheated because of the larger number they were selling. The worst thing is that they know the player would feel cheated by this. They played the same card in the first game with number 5 in rank. No one have seen a problem with that, because there was no build up for the fight, and the game promised 10 fights, and delivered 10 fights. If you count Henry, 
Therefore, no one felt blue-balled by it. This problem could be solved if the number of ranked assassins was lower. But they insisted on making a self-reference. The three guys skipped thanks to Henry would not be a problem if the writers did not decide to do the quote-unquote the game is stuffed full as it is joke. Saying this, then throwing us at a dungeon that serves just to kill time is the same as calling the player an idiot. This is even worse if you consider other elements of the game, like the removal of the open world. The majority of minigames are in this 8-bit style. The majority of bosses barely have dungeons, at the point that some of them don't even have a dungeon at all. There are times that the game delivers the more serial stone that was promised. However, when they manage to do this, it is by evolving one of the themes from the first game. For example, Krav is regretting killing vulnerable adversaries. Listen, throwing all these points at the same time might sound like I hate this game. It is quite the opposite. If it was a standalone game, or even the first in the franchise, the majority of these criticisms would not be valid. But it falls short on many topics when you put it as a sequel of the first game. Of course, it is superior on the more technical regards, like graphics, combats and gameplay. Which are important things, however, since the first game, the differential has been the story and characters. I don't see any problems on the matter of characters, but the story has all those problems I have pointed. Being honest, they don't stop you from enjoying the game. What really matters is another topic I have pointed, that all the good things are countered by a bad thing. This basically defines the game. No More Heroes 2 is the definition of mid. The problem is that a mid game is easily forgotten by the public. Both bad and good are constantly being talked about, always being used as an example for something, either what to do or not to do. The official version of why the series had a 10 year hiatus was that the studio had other projects in mind. And it makes sense for this series to be put in second plan considering all the factors involved. Both games being Wii exclusives for a considerable time probably limited the series' growth. This game was supposed to bring a lot more people to the series, but it failed in this regard, and creating another title for the series would be too risky and time-consuming for a small studio. The funny thing is that, despite all its problems, I still like this game very much. I believe this is a series people will end up rediscovering in the future. I wanted to present all of this game's flaws to make one point. This game was essential for the series, most things in it can be fixed by minor changes, but the real flaws only happened because the creators could not handle where the series would be grounded up. For example, the next game in the series is considered one of the best games of the franchise, exactly because the game works basically with its own mythos, and I think this is why most people don't see a problem with it when something crazy happens. No More Heroes 2 could not decide which identity it would follow, but it's still very enjoyable and you definitely should play it if you are just learning about the series right now. If you got here, consider liking and subscribing. Stay tuned, there will be more to come soon. Finally, here she is, Sylvia. I was looking for you. My eyes. Can I open my eyes? Yeah, it's real. Let's go home. Santa Destroy needs us. Travis, I know more heroes.